Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 18th of the seventh month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with September 28th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> and we are in the midst of the Feast of Booths, if you will, or Tabernacles. We're currently continuing with our reading of Bereshit, or Genesis, and we're on the last two chapters. We thought it might be prudent to go over what it says in a version of the Brenton Septuagint, or Septuagente, if they, as they call it. Although the wording may be a little different from what we're familiar with in the Masoretic text, please do try to compare it, try to see how this has been fulfilled in the children for each one, or if you're not familiar, then feel free to ask. A lot of these are used. <clears throat> this particular chapter, 49, as well as the foretellings given by Moshe at the end of Deuteronomy, before the children went into the land, are used by, generally by the likes of Stephen Collins and other preponderance to show where the 12 tribes had gone off to in dispersion based on what their foretellings say. But right here is chapter 49. It says, And Jacob called his sons and said to them, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the last days. If you remember the last days began, it was the last days when our Mashiach was on the earth. And a lot of people have a lot of reasons for their context or what they say in regards to those things. I don't really know all the nuances of it. The only regards that I, I know of that scripture says about this, and you guys can correct me or anyone that listens to this can, can correct me if I'm wrong or share with me what they might know. But the only scriptural references to the last days is in regard to the, the creation week. It's the fourth, fifth, and sixth days of creation week before the millennial reign that he was declaring the, the last days in. If there's any other context from Scripture, please share. But I, I don't know of any. A lot of men have a lot of different ideas about it, and we, we talked about that before with the 120 years example from uh, Genesis where Moshe, sorry, where Noah is told that the Ruach of Elohim would not always strive with man, but they had 120 years until the flood, which we find out from the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> Anyways, it says, Gather yourselves together and hear me, sons of Jacob. Hear Yisrael, hear your father. There's three mentions of it there. I, I would like to point out, this is 17 years after Jacob came into the land of Egypt. Where he's 147 here, coming up to the, the, the life of his mother, and uh, also in health. But just for context, he lived to 137, or 147 rather, and it was Louis that lived to 137. And then of his children, Moshe was 120, but the um, all the patriarchs, like most of them lived to about 125. Some of them a little bit longer, some of them a little bit less. Yahusuf was 110, for example. Moshe was 120, but most of the patriarchs coming out of Troy, like the, the Hebrews that left beforehand and the survivors that went from Troy to Carthrit or to... Um, Crete, from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul, and from Gaul to Scotland, their lifespans were generally 125 years. So it, it was not always exclusive in going down. It depended on, well, other factors as well. Point being, they were still living almost a century for a few generations after this time even into the times of Moshe, where you might have had others dying younger, he was living at least that long. Right. Here we go. It says, Reuben, you are my firstborn. 
you my strength and the first of my children. Hard to be endured, self-willed. You were insolent like water, burst not forth with violence. For you went up to the bed of your father. Then you defiled the couch whereupon you went up. And that usually is tied to the constellation of Aquarius for the water buckets being poured out. And this is generally related to France, they say. I don't want to get into all the nuances behind it because I don't recall them all off the top of my head. I do believe that Stephen Collins, of his four books that are still being published, he's the one that goes into the most detail about the, the specific tribes and where they went. There's also a gentleman, I believe he's a, a Yahudi or a Jew from Scotland, but he, he is Yerid Davidi. Yerid Davidi. I, I believe that's how his name is pronounced. Either way, he has the Brit Am organization and he does a great deal of work on the locations of the 12 tribes and that information. So wonderful stuff from them. Shimon and Louis, brethren, accomplish the injustice of their cutting off. Let not my soul come into their counsel. And let not mine inward parts contend in their conspiracy. For in their wrath they slew men, and in their passion they hewed a bull. Cursed be their wrath, for it was willful, and their anger, for it was cruel. Now this says cruel here, but it literally means hardened or aggravated. If you remember, Shimon means here believe and do, and Louis are those that are joined unto him. Both of them scattered throughout the 12 tribes as a type and shadow of what was to come. But Louis in particular, if you read the Testament, he foretold to his children that they would be directly responsible for betraying the truth when he came. And if you remember, it was the, uh, the children that went to Aaron and said, you make us a mighty one, and he went ahead and accomplished it. But it was the willful and aggravated sin on his part that is the conspiracy in his children later on if you can see that and what was being done because they are it's the kohanim the chief priests if you will along with the scribes and pharisees that betrayed him but right here shimon is those who hear believe and do and louis is those who are joined unto him and it's always been those that are closest that knew the truth that willfully do wrong that was being spoken of here under his wrath. <clears throat> but anyways, it says, For in their wrath they slew men, and in their passion they hewed a bull. Cursed be their wrath, for it was willful, and their anger, for it was hardened or aggravated. I will divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Yisrael. Yahuda, your brethren have praised you, and your hands shall be on the back of your enemies. Your father's son shall do you reverence. It says, Yahuda is a lion's whelp. From the tender plant, my son, you are gone up. Having couched, thou liest as a lion and as a whelp who shall stir him up. Now, in the other version, it clearly represents a young lion, the crouching lion, and the old lion, right? or there's three different versions. And that was carried on through the arms or the heraldry of Yahuda through perpetuity, where you have the different insignia with the three lions. The other ones that represent Yahuda is the single lion, both of the yellow or from the line of Zara, the red lion, and then a crowned lion to represent the line of David specifically, or Dawid. When you have the non-royal version of Dawid, it was the Mo the Mogan Dawid, the, the shield or star of David, as they call it, and also the harp of David, as it is known. But those are not always used in conjunction with non-royalty, because it's on the Irish and British uh, heraldry as well. But generally, where you have Yahuda ruling, and he's not a king, 
you'll have the, the Mogan Dawid or the star rather than the lions represented or the crown. These are all known from um, from antiquity. There's a, a, a few books that are written with this in regard. There's one that is specifically on the topic of the Celto-Saxon heritage or the symbols of our Celto-Saxon heritage, if you will. And it goes over the heraldry in particular. But uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that. The point being, these are all, every one of these also a part of the heraldry for each of the tribes. And you can follow it down through history where they, not everywhere they migrated, but generally where they went throughout Europe is very well known because of this. It says, a ruler shall not fail from Yahuda, nor a prince from his loins until there comes the things stored up for him. And he is in, until Shiloh comes, right? And he is the expectation of the Gentiles. This was fulfilled in the coming of our Mashiach, where the Maccabees, who were of Yahuda from their mother's line, all the way back from the time where Aaron married Nahash's sister, the leader of the tribe of Yahuda's sister. From that time on, Yahuda and Louis were intermarried, just like our Mashiach was to come from both, but predominantly from Yahuda. You can find that echoed throughout time. Uh, because of that, however, just as Tetafi married into the line of Zerah and the seed of Dawid was reigning through her, through her children, and that was when it was foretold that the the exalted tree would be humbled and the humbled one would be exalted by giving the kingship from the Pharaoh's line to the Zara line. Just as that happened, you can see that it was lawful for the sons of Aaron of the line of Yahuda through their maternal line to also hold kingship. Although it was not directly from the line of David and it did not continue it was not cursed or was not rebuked by our creator in any capacity because it was literally fulfillment of these prophecies right here or the foretelling. But this is spoken of very clearly by Kepha and by Irenaeus and others that the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans ruled until Herod became king. And during the time of Herod, when a ruler failed from Yahuda, was when our Mashiach was born. It wasn't until the end of his reign, but it did happen at that time exactly as it was foretold. And then this is more of the foretellings about when he came. Binding his fowl to the vine and the fowl of, a, of his, or the, the colt of his donkey to the branch, where it mentions the, the fowl and the mother, right? He shall wash his robe in wine and his garment in the blood of the grape. His eyes shall be more cheering than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell on the coast, which never happened in the land there, and he by the haven of ships, and shall extend to Zidon. They believe that Zebulun, if you read his testament, he was, he was the one that Yahusuf tried to hide behind when his brothers were trying to take him into captivity. And while the reformations were budding and while these things were going on, it was Holland that the Protestants fled to for succor at a time and then came back as a type and shadow of that. And that's generally a place of havens for ships where he was the first to do sailing from his testament. There's a lot involved in that, but they generally believe that Holland is represented here. Yishakar has desired that which is Tov, resting between the inheritances. And having seen the resting place that it was Tov, and the land that it was fertile, he subjected his shoulder to labor, this is tribute, becoming a servant, right? And became a husbandman. Um, this one is also generally known between Germany and Russia. I can't remember what place it is, though, because my geography isn't the best. Uh, and I don't remember exactly where he placed all of them. The ones that are most prominent, the ones I'm most familiar with are Gad, 
Dan, Ephraim, Menashe, and the things of that nature. <clears throat> but to continue here, it says, Dan shall judge his people as one tribe too in Israel, and let Dan be a serpent in the way, besetting the path, biting the hill of the horse, and the rider shall fall backward. Now, the horse and the rider we've talked about before, whether or not that's an allusion to these, I can't directly say. There's been different, different things spoken of. And the idea that Dan, as a tribe, was representative of Yahuda Ishkiriot, or the one that betrayed him, was foreknown as a type before because of all the tribes that were in the land they left. They didn't keep the covenant promised to them. They took off and they were doing evil to their brothers all from an early time. They went into ball worship and they took it to Ireland and Denmark and they were paganized for a very, very long time and generally went from that into Catholicism. They're mentioned by um, Hippolytus, the taught one of Irenaeus, the taught one of Polycarp, the taught one of Yahukanon, in his trustees on Antichrist as the Antichrist, as the tribe that represented what he would do. And if you think about what Roman Catholicism is, it's directly in line with that theme. So it was foretelling that type, and I, that's why I mentioned it to you. But they are one of the tribes. It's when they repent that they're going to be biting the heel of that horse and the rider and having it fall backwards, right? But generally, they've been antagonistic to his people, to those that are pursuing the truth, just as Dan hated his brother and was very angry with him, and almost all of his sons died and he was sick. Same thing with Gad, which is Spain. The things that they've done to Yahusuf or England and America with our popular governments and trying to crush them through the holy alliance with rome and the black conspiracy there this is literally these foretellings in history being played out so what i've been trying to point out if you guys can see that and if you if you can't then father willing the more we go along the more it will make sense to you but it says Besetting the path, biting the hill of the horse, and the rider shall fall backward, waiting for the deliverance of Yahuwah. Waiting, right? It, we mentioned it before. Kepha says, when men turn their minds to obedience to the truth, that's when things will change. And it's universal. We'll go ahead and right, right here. It says, Gad, a plundering troop, shall plunder him, but he shall plunder him closely. Asher, his bread, fat, and he shall yield dainties to princes. Naphthalim, or Naphtali, that word right there without the end, the Ephthalim, that was a name for the white Huns, which they were the white Huns. The tribe of Naphtali stayed together almost entire. They also stayed in, the, in Asia, or the Middle East, if you will, for longer than most of their brethren. But eventually, the White Huns were ran into Europe and went into what we call Scandinavia and parts of Finland and Lapland, I think. But the original indigenous people there kind of moved over and then they amalgamated. There's still generally, um, there's some mixture in the, the people, like if you want to say the ethnicities or races, if you will, but there's still generally two types in that area oriental and caucasian just like there's two types in russia there's orientals or asiatics or like um sons of yafeth from the far east and caucasians that have generally been intermixed there but to continue naphtali is a spreading stem bestowing beauty on its fruit Yahusuf is a son increased, and Yahusuf is Yahuwah will increase or gather, which is what that means. My dearly loved son is increased, my youngest son 
turned to me. Against whom men eat taking evil counsel reproached, and the archers pressed hard upon him. But their bow and arrows were mightily consumed, and the sinews of their arms were slackened by the hand of the mighty one of Yaakov. Thence is he that strengthened Yisrael from the El of your father. And my El help you. And he Barak you with the Baraka or blessing of Shemaim from above, and the Baraka of the earth, possessing all things. Because of the blessing or Baraka of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father and your mother, it has prevailed above the Baraka of the lasting mountains and beyond the Baraka or blessings of the everlasting hills. They shall be upon the head of Yahusuf and upon the head of the brothers of whom he took the lead. Now that reads quite different from the version that we have in the Masoretic text. But if you think about what happened in history and how the um, popular governments and the movements happened amongst Ephraim and Menashe, America and Britain respectively, where you had the rights of people, the common law become prevalent and power was given from that throughout the world. You can see how that is affected here. We're currently losing that because as with our forefathers before us, as a people, when we turn from the truth, we have our enemies rule over us. But this is generally about America and Britain, respectively. And not just the land of Great Britain or the, the island of Britain, but the, the commonwealth, the nation and the company of nations. Right here, Benjamin, as a raving wolf, he shall still or he shall eat still in the morning, and at evening he gives food. This one is quoted and for and spoken of as foretelling the coming of Shaul in its com in its full culmination. But it was foreshadowed in the tribe of Benjamin being the first to <clears throat> be like a raving wolf against their brethren, how they committed what should not have been done, and then they were almost wiped out. And afterwards, also in a type with Shaul as a raving wolf at first, but then later his children eating at the, or his um, son's son, who was a cripple, eating at the table of the beloved as, as a type and picture of Shaul that would come. And that was spoken of also by Hippolytus, I believe Irenaeus is taught one. The writing that both of those is in, if I remember correctly, is the refutation against all heresies and the trustees on Antichrist, respectively. <clears throat> this is all these, the twelve sons of Jacob, and their father spoke these words to them, and he baruch them. He baruch each of them according to his baraka, and he said to them, I am added to my people. You shall bury me with my fathers in the cave, which is in the cave of Ephron the Hittite, in the double cave which is opposite Mambri, and or in the land of Canaan, Canaan, the cave which Abraham bought of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a sepulcher, for, for a place to bury the dead, right? There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Yitzhak and Rebekah, his wife. There they buried Leah in the portion of the field and of the cave that was in it, of the sons of Chet. And Jacob ceased giving charges to his sons and having lifted up his feet on the bed, he died and was gathered to his people. Now, we'll be getting to the testaments of the 12 patriarchs after this, and then shortly into that, we'll also cover the few that link between 
the times of the patriarchs in Egypt and the time of Moshe. Of those, we have the visions of Amram and the testament of Kohath, although in the other order. The testament of Kohath first, then the visions of Amram, and he was the father of Aharon and Moshe. He actually had Moshe, or um, he didn't have his children roughly, but Moshe about 22 years before he passed away. But Moshe was still a teenager. I believe he was 17 at the time. We'll, we'll find all that out as we read the, the uh, Testaments themselves. But in the meantime, here's chapter 50. <clears throat> also, for co corroborating information in regard to these things, the Patterns of Evidence, that is a newer movie that's out, a documentary, really covers the city of Avaris and all the cities that were in that area built by Hebrews, how very expansive it was, the Exodus path. These are second witnesses to our brother, our late brother, Ron Wyatt, who is the first our father was pleased to allow to discover these things in this current age or our lifetime anyways. He discovered Noah's Ark the path of the exodus the the red sea crossing the real mount sinai where later discoveries have also been had right found out the the first place the the place where noah built a home in the mountains of ararat there and then also discovered the ark of the covenant amazing things that our father gave into his hand because he was a humble servant just something to keep in mind. It says, And Yahusha fell upon his father's face and wept on him and kissed him. And Yahusha commanded his servants, the embalmers, to embalm his father. And the embalmers embalmed Yisrael. And they fulfilled forty days for him, for so are the days of embalming numbered. And Egypt mourned for him seventy days. And when the days of mourning were past, Yahusha spoke to the princes of Pharaoh, saying, If I have found favor in your sight, speak concerning me in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father adjured me, or judged to me, right, he commanded me, when you adjure, it means it's not quite an oath, but he makes it's like a promise or a thing you said you were going to do that's like an oath. In the sepulcher which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there shall you bury me. Now then will I go up and bury my father and return again. And Pharaoh said to Yahusuf, Go up, bury your father as he constrained you to swear. So Yahusuf went up to bury his father, and all the servants of Pharaoh went up with him, and the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the household of Yahusuf and his brethren, and all the house of his father and his kindred, and they left behind the sheep and the oxen in the land of Goshen. Now, go shin is what we normally have it hit. This is gesim. So that's a little bit different spelling. There is another different variant spelling there. That might be common between the, the Greek Septuagint from the Masoretic text. Says, and there went up with him also chariots and horsemen, and there was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Yarden. And they bewailed him with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And the inhabitants of the land of Canaan saw the mourning at the floor of Atad, and said, This is a great mourning to the Egyptians. Therefore he called its name the mourning of Egypt, which is beyond Jordan or Yarden. And thus his sons did to him. 
So his sons carried him up into the land of Canaan and buried him in the double cave, which cave Abraham bought for a possession of a burial place of Ephraim, of Ephraim the Hittite before Mambri. And Yahusuf returned to, to Egypt, or Mitzrayim, he and his brethren, and those that had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, the, one of the things that Ron White also found was the cave of Mikpilah, or the double cave where their burial was, which I, I'll try to link the video in the description, or I'll share it in the telegram for everyone, okay? But um, one more thing I wanted to point out here, if I can remember what it was. The uh... Oh, right. So this is another... This is another part where if we ever go over the book of Jasher, you'll find it's in disagreement. You don't see anything here. There's not one reference of Edom. Not any mention of Edom in regard to any part of their going out of Egypt to bury Jacob. He is not mentioned as encountering them or talking to them one word or another, not him or his sons. Neither do they have any fighting or anything mentioned whatsoever. But in the book of Jasher, it's at this time when they go to bury his father that Edom is said to confront them and they have a very large battle where they fight and Edom, the patriarch of that people, is supposedly killed. That version is in disagreement with what you can read in the Testament of Yahuda and the book of Jubilees both of which were found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, unlike the book of Jasher, which none of that was found amongst any of the scrolls. So that's one of many examples of there being disagreements, just plain contradictions and things that are not actually true, but different from what is presented in other writings. Another one is the way that Cain killed Abel. In the book of Jasher, it says he did it with an implement, a metal implement, and with Yobelim. And elsewhere, it mentions that he did it with a stone. And it was because he used a stone to kill his brother that it was with the stone that he was killed when his house fell on him after the death of his father, Adam. But th that's getting too far sidetracked again. It's just this is one of the major places where there's a huge hiccup because there's a very large section about what happened between Edom and Yisrael and the reason for that and what it foretells. And when you have other stories and things that you believe instead of the truth that was given, it muddies that up. But right here, we'll finish. It says, And when the brethren of Yahusuf saw that their father was dead, they said, let us take heed. That's in italics, right? Least at any time, Yahusuf, remember evil against us and recompense to us all the evils which we have done to him. And they came to Yahusuf and said, Your father adjured before his death, saying, Thus say you to Yahusuf, Forgive them their injustice and their sin. For as much as they have done you evil, and now pardon the injustice or unrighteousness of the servants of Elohim of your father, or of the servants of the Elohim of your father. And Yahusuf wept while they spoke to him. You might conjecture on why, because it doesn't specify, but think about all the things he's done to benefit them and how he's never ill-treated them even when they returned, but, but now they're concerned because their father's not there, right? This is his compassion that he has towards his brothers. And they came to him and said, We, these are your servants. And Yahusuf said to them, Fear not, for I am Elohim's. You took counsel against me for evil, but Elohim took counsel for me for good. That might be as today, and much people might be fed. And he said to them, Fear not, 
I will maintain you and your families. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And Yahusuf dwelt in Egypt, and his brethren, and all the family of his father. And Yahusuf lived a hundred, an hundred and ten years. He was thirty years old when he was ruling with Pharaoh, and the famine happened at that time for seven years. It was Yisrael came in. Um, the famine would have ended at his being thirty-seven, but his father would have lived for 17 years. And I believe after that, it was about 70, 71 where he ruled. And then he died at 110. We'll go into that more when we get to the chronology of things, probably when we're reading through the Testaments of the 12 patriarchs next. And generally we're going to try to read them in the order of the men's death, which is not how it's lined up there, but, um, we might put together a little bit of the timeline first to show everybody, or we could just read it and you can see it as we go along. We'll, we'll figure out what you prefer to do, but we'll go ahead and finish this real quick. It says, And Yahusuf saw the children of Ephraim to the third generation, and the sons of Malkir, the son of Manasseh, were born on the sides or thighs of Yahusuf. So his children's children's children, right? And Yahusha spoke to his brethren, saying, I die, and Elohim will surely visit you, and will bring you out of this land to the land concerning which Elohim swear to our fathers Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. And Yahusha adjured the sons of Yisrael, saying, At the visitation with which Elohim shall visit you, then you shall carry up my bones hence with you. And Yahusuf died, aged a hundred and ten years. And they prepared his corpse and put him in the coffin in Egypt. They buried him in the coffin in Egypt. And that is also found where they buried him and where they originally kept the sepulchers of the patriarchs before taking them into the land to bury them is in Goshen. They've actually found that area and they show um, some pretty interesting things and the patterns of evidence there. But I'm willing that was edifying for everyone and it helps us get a little bit more perspective about the things that we might see coming on in the future. We should be segueing from here into the beginnings of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. We, we might read the beginning of... Um, the book of Exodus, but that will be afterwards because it's not until after the times of the patriarchs generally where you have what's coming next. Although just for just for everyone to comprehend things, Kohath was born, uh, I think the son of Louis was born either just after or before they went into the captivity. Then it was Amram was born in the land there, and he was in the captivity. He died where there were 153 years in the land already. It was during the time of Amram that the children were brought into captivity. Specifically, after he was separated from Jochebed, his wife, for 40 years, and the land was cut off, they couldn't go across the borders because of the, the fighting between Canaan and Egypt. We'll get into more details with it later. But if you remember, Satan, the ruler of the world, wanted to destroy the promises and ruin the things that our Creator said he was going to do. And he knew that it was going to be through a particular seed. So he had them, and he knew it was going to belong in a, in a particular land. So he had those that were his conquer that land and corrupt it first, and then fighting and actively participating in trying to keep that promised seed out. The kings of Canaan fought the Mitzrayites, which they were brothers, they were related. But once they conquered them, they shut the borders over, and then it was a Canaanite pharaoh, that the one that didn't know Yahusuf, that got the people to conspire to enslave the rest of the Hebrews. But that's um, what we'll get into more at a later time.
At this point, they were exalted going into the land, highly esteemed, benefiting others. They caused the circumcision to be practiced by a lot of the Egyptians and then later on those of Persia, which were from the descendants of uh, Eleazar, Abraham's servant. That's mentioned in the recognitions of Clement, but you find the idea of the the circumcision spreading out to different people in history. It's talked about by the cultists, by some the Greeks and the other Phoenicians before they were Hellenized, and then with the um, Persians that came over from Egypt and the Egyptians here that had been in relationship with the Hebrews and some of them partaking. But that's all for when we continue. Until then, you have a wonderful Shabbat, a great Shavuot Tov or week ahead, and we will see you next time.